Hi, my name is Dr. Ahmedov Bokhalev. In this semester, I'm going to teach you the course of linear algebra. So this is going to be our first introductory lecture where we're going to discuss about the objectives of the course and the content of the course. I will give you the brief information about what we are going to learn during this semester. So I need to mention, first of all, that the linear algebra is a science about the system of linear equations and the matrices. And in the beginning, we're going to start talking about the matrices. So the matrices are really important for us because nowadays uh, we, can, we can store the data in the matrices and work with the data using the matrices. So it's really important now to make the analysis of the data. And one of the ways to learn how to make the analysis of the data is to learn how to work with the matrices. So, and whenever I say the data, I mean everything like the photos, the videos, or some like a weather for forecast or some computational data. So all of these things can be stored in a computer as the matrices. So let's discuss what is the matrix. So the matrix is a two dimensional table with a certain number of the rows and a certain number of the columns. So throughout this course, we're going to denote the dimension of the matrices as N by M, where N is going to be the number of the rows and M is going to be the number of the columns. So basically, if you are given a matrix with two rows and three columns, then this is going to be the matrix with the dimension two by three. Okay, so inside this matrix, we're obviously are going to have N times M elements, right? So basically, if you're going to have two by two matrix, then there are four elements inside your matrix. And every element inside this matrix has its own coordinate. So it has its own location, basically. So if, for example, your matrix is N by M, then we're going to have N times M elements, where every single element is going to have its, its coordinate, right? For example, A3 by Q, means that this is an element at the third row in the second column. Or for example, A21 means that this is an element on the second row and the first column. So it is really important for us to orientate inside the matrices. So we're going to start on the top left corner is going to be the starting point of the matrix, right? A11. And the ending, and the ending point is going to be here on the uh, right bottom corner. So do you see that every time, so like after some time, if you forgot somehow the matrices and, and, and you would not be able to remember what comes first, like, hey, like if you're given the entry two by three, how to find is whether well, two is the number of the, like the row number or the column number, you need to always keep in mind that rows come first, okay? So here, the, whenever we define the dimension of the matrices, so we usually write down, first of all, the number of the rows. And whenever we define the coordinates of the element, again, we are going to define the row number as the first. Row number, two, and then column number. So the number of the rows times the number of the columns. So this is essentially the important things about the dimension, how we're going to define the dimension of the matrices, and how we're going to define the entries inside the matrices. So Throughout this course, we're going to learn about lots of operations with the matrices, basically how to add and subtract the T matrices or how to multiply the matrices. So the matrix multiplication is a little bit more complicated than just addition or subtraction, but we're going to learn through, through this course how to, how to do these things. So, um, so another thing which we're going to start talking about the first few weeks of the lecture are the vectors. So it is really important for us to learn the vectors or redefine everything which we've learned in the previous courses in calculus. So if you remember in calculus, if, if you are given a vector, then we used to define this using the two tuples or three tuples or n tuples. So basically a sequence of numbers inside the brackets. So here we are going to define the vectors using the matrices again. So we're going to do by the convention that all of the vectors are going to be defined as the column vectors. It means that the like the coordinates or the elements of the of the vectors are going to be stored in one column matrix. Okay, so that is why if the vector has n components, then this this vector is going to have n rows in one column. 
So if you remember, we have defined uh, the the various type of the multiplications for the vectors in the calculus courses. Like, a, hey, if you're given a vector, you can multiply a scalar to the vector, or you can multiply two vectors as a scalar product or the vector product. So while here in linear algebra, we are not going to have any type of the different multiplication rather than the matrix multiplication. So we have only one multiplication, which is the matrix multiplication. So you can't really multiply any two matrices. Right, so as a matrix multiplication, there should be a certain conditions on the dimensions of the first matrix and the second matrix. So throughout this course, we're going to learn how to multiply, for example, the T vectors in order to get uh, a dot product, for example, or how we can just multiply the T vectors in order to get a matrix and so on. So everything is going to be done just using one multiplication. So there's no going to be like a dot or cross or something like this. So it's going to be just the multiplication of the matrices. So it is really important for us so that we are going to have just one unique system, right? So or just everything is going to be uniform. So the same system for the matrices and for the vectors as well. So also we're going to define the equations of the planes and the lines using the vectors. So they are called the vector equations of the planes and lines. So we need to define these equations uh, using the vectors because we are going to talk about the higher dimensional cases. Like, so we're not talking about the planes on 2D or 3D. We're going to talk about the planes in like n dimensional cases, like a hundred dimensional cases. So that is why it is really important for us to define everything using the vector equations. And in order to define them, we are going to need the vectors. So the next central topic, which we're going to talk about in this course, like I think we're going to talk about the system of linear equations for, for, for all the course it is about this. Yeah, so this is going to be the system of linear equations. So the system of linear equations is a bunch of linear equations with some number of the variables. For example, here we've got two variables, x and y. So that one solution, one pair of numbers for the x and y, or one vector of the numbers for all the variables are going to satisfy all of the equations at the same time. So that is why it is called like a system of linear equations. So there should be one solution for all of the linear equations. So, well, we are going to learn how to solve this kind of, uh, th this kind of system of linear equations. So probably you know how to solve like a system of linear equations with the T equations and T amounts. So you can do this manually. Or if you're given even like a three equations or even four equations, you can probably do this. I barely can solve like a four, uh, a system with a four equations, but still it is like really difficult for me. So I need to spend lots of time. So, and can you imagine that in practice, we need to solve a system with hundreds or thousand equations in the system. So for example, whenever we're going to have like a artificial intelligence systems or machine learning systems, we need to build everything using the system of linear equations with lots of equations in the system, maybe hundred or thousand equations. And solving them manually is not possible anymore. So we basically need uh, computers, the help of the computer in order to solve a system with lots of equations. So one way to solve this using a computer to be, first of all, store this equations in a computer. So we are going to store again the system of linear equations using the matrices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down this system equation, this system of linear equations, and the three matrices. So what we need to do is we first of all need to just copy the constants before the variables, like a two, three, minus five and 18 to the first matrix. So here, sorry, there's a typo, so there should be minus five here. So this matrix is going to be called as a coefficient matrix. So in, in the second vector, which is just coming after the coefficient matrix, we are going to store the variables, X and Y in this case. And in the, in the vector in, on the right hand side part, we're going to just store this two constants, six and zero. So basically instead of writing down the system of linear equations, we are going to write a system like this. And we're going to store this system of linear equations 
using the three matrices on the computers. So now solution of the system of linear equations is equivalent to the solution of this system or of this equation of the matrix equation. Ax is equal to the b. So I've got like a, this equation, a times x is equal to the b. And what I need to do is I need to find a vector x, uh, which would be the solution. For example, in this case, the vector x, the solution is going to be this vector with the values 2.11 and 0 0.59. What does it mean? It means that if you would multiply this matrix A to this vector, then you would get exactly this B, okay? At the same time, you should, you should know that if you substitute X was a 2.11 and Y was a 0 0.59 into the system here or here, that both of the equations are going to be correct. Like the left-hand side is going to be equal to the right-hand side. So basically solving a system is solving the, this matrix equation. And we're interested to find such a vector which would satisfy this vector equation or this matrix equation. So AX, the multiplication of the A to the X should be equal to the B. So um, there are so like the, there are different type of the number of the, uh, so there are different scenarios on the number of the solutions for any system of linear equations. So in our case, we used to have, uh, we, we have just one equation, one solution, uh, but usually there are three different scenarios. Like it, it is possible that your system has no solution or your system has infinitely many solutions. But if your system it has infinitely many solutions, we can't really say, hey, the, it is going to have infinitely many solutions. We need to learn how to build uh, sets or spaces for all of the solutions. So the next topic which we're going to discuss are, are going to be a little bit more, more uh, like the algorithms, how to solve this kind of systems, okay? And it's really important for us to learn about something which is called the complexity. So I think you're going to talk about the complexity issues in the course of this good maths, but you should mention that the complexity usually comes with the powers of the n. So for example, n in a cube or n in a square or n, so we, where n is basically the number of something. For example, here, uh, finding the inverse of the matrix is, is okay, so it's some algorithm. So something which is called like a Gauss-Jordan elimination. It requires n cube operations where n is going to be the size of the matrix, okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to learn how to solve, how to solve the matrix So we are going to discuss how to solve the matrix equations. And one of the algorithms which we're going to learn is the Okay, so one of the algorithms which we're going to learn is the Gauss-Jordan elimination. So which is going to be our central algorithm. So we're going to do everything with this algorithm. And you can see here, it's a complexity is n cube. So I need to mention that n cube is a really complex algorithm. So basically it takes a lot of time. So we are going to talk about the Gauss-Jordan elimination. So it basically, in order to like learn how it works, how this algorithm works, we need to talk about the elementary operations. So what does it mean, the elementary operations? So if you're given a system of linear equations, could you please like remind, so tell me how to solve this kind of system of linear equations? You probably remember that, hey, you can just multiply one of the equations to some constant and add this into the another one in order to get rid of one of the variables. Then you're going to have a, the, the equations with only one variable and you can solve this and substitute this back to the previous equation and solve this, right? So I'm going to explain you, for example, if you're given here the, the first equation, tx plus three y, in order to get rid of the x, for example, I could just multiply the first equation to the five over t and add this to the second, right? So if you do this, you're going to basically have this, the following equation, 25.5 y is equal to the 15. So which is like really easy to solve, right? So you're going to divide both of the sides to the 25.5. So the y is going to be 15 divided to the 25.5, right? Then you can just substitute the y to one of this equation to here or to here and solve dx. 
So this is how we can solve the system of linear equations. So this is the same idea which we're going to do when we're going to solve a matrix equations. So we are going to define three elementary operations over the matrices. So one is going to be, hey, we can interchange the equations. So whenever we're talking about the matrix, it is going to be interchanging the rows. So hey, we can multiply one of the equations to some constant and add this to another. So this is what we've done here, right? We multiply all first equation is a five over two. So here, if you do this, here you're going to have plus five X, right? Plus 15 Y over T plus 30 over two or 15, right? Then you can just add this to the second so that five X and negative five X are going to just cancel each other. So we can do this operation and also we can do the operation or multiplying uh, one of the equations to some constant. So the three elementary operations are going to be defined at the end of the matrices and we're going to use this, the same idea in order to solve the system of the equations. So this algorithm, we solve the equations by just eliminating one variable after the second, is called like a Gauss elimination method or Gauss elimination algorithm. So our first algorithm, which we're going to learn is the Gauss elimination algorithm. So which is really powerful because it has, it can find like, it, it can solve a way, uh, a, a wide range of the problems and applications in this course. So now the issue which we are going to talk about, which is going to be a little bit more theoretical, are the matrix spaces. So if you remember, I told you that, hey, the system of linear equations might have an infinitely many solutions. So in this case, we need to be able to build a spaces. So one of the, like a two important spaces considered about the matrices are the so-called null space and the column space. So let me briefly explain you what, this is, what is this. And later on in the course, we're going to go a little deeper, try to understand why we actually need these spaces and, and, and how to use them in, in practice. So the null space is, is about this kind of systems where we're going to solve AX is equal to the zero. Well, obviously the right hand side part here, zero is not just a scalar, it's not a number. So zero means it's a vector again, okay? So AX is equal to the zero. So any value or any vector of all the X which would solve the system is in the null space, okay? So basically the collection of all the vectors X, all of the possible vectors X, which would just make the multiplication of the A to the X to be equal to the zero, is the null space. So obviously the null space always has some vectors, right? So it's always, it's a non-empty set. So you may guess that if you are going to choose the X as the zero vector with lots of zeros, then it would be a solution always, right? Because if you multiply the A to the zero vector, you obviously are going to get a zero vector. But we are, are going to examine our systems whether it is possible to figure out the non-zero solutions or non-trivial solutions for this kind of systems. So it's it's all also really important for us to understand some like some some features of the data which is stored in this metric space. So there is another vector space or there is another space about the matrices which is called a column space. So essentially, what does it mean is all possible vectors B. Okay. So what does it mean? So you, you can, here, you can multiply A to the X with a different vector X. So it tells you, hey, just take any vector for the X, any which you can, and just multiply A to the X and obtain the B, okay? So for all of the vectors which you can form by multiplying the A to any vector X is going to be a column space. So we're going to discuss actually why we actually need the column space, but here is the definition of the column space. So all possible vectors you can generate by multiplying your matrix to any vector X. So here you, you will be given just the matrix A. Okay, so X is not going to be given, but we are going to learn how to build this kind of spaces as well. So another issue which we're going to discuss is about the dependent vectors. So obviously when we discuss about the system of linear equations, we say that, hey, so there is a certain type of the systems where we're going to have infinite many solutions. So this is exactly this system when we're going to have infinite many solutions. 
So if you see that we basically have here not two equations in our system, but essentially second equation is, is the first one just multiplied to the two, right? So if you multiply the first equation to the two, you are simply are going to get the second equation. So we're basically given one equation and two variables, x and y. So if you remember this from the school, this kind of systems was one equation and two variables are going to have infinite limit solutions. So this happens because these two equations are dependent. So if you, uh, so uh, we are going to discuss about the dependency of the vectors. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this vector with the components two and four, and I'm going to sketch this vector. So let's sketch this vector. And another vector with the components three and four is essentially the vector on the same line. So if two vectors lie basically on the same line, we say that these two vectors are, are dependent, okay? So obviously if you're going to have three vectors, then there is another concept of the dependency of the vectors. So the two vectors should lie on one plane and, and so on. But for the two vectors, the concept is really easy. So the two vectors are independent if they lie on the same line. So if these two vectors are dependent, then our system is going to have infinite domain solution. So you see, so depending on whether these kind of vectors are dependent or independent, we can also know how many solutions our system is going to have. So we're going to discuss and explore more about the dependent and independent vectors in higher dimensions as well. So we are going to learn about basically about the matrix operations, not only the multiplication and the addition, we're going to learn about something which is called a transposition and also the, like one of the like interesting operations of the matrices is going to be the inverse of the matrix. So we are going to define the inverse of the matrix as A in a power of minus one, and the, by the definition, this is such a matrix so that if you multiply this as A, you are going to have just identity matrix. So the identity matrix is uh, a matrix version of one. So we're going to talk about this later on. So you just need to understand that this is kind of one. So the, this is going to be called as an inverse of the matrix. So it's, it's really difficult to find the inverse actually. So it's complexities like N cube, as we have seen before, so I need to mention that n cube is really complex algorithm in terms of the computational time. So first of all, we can basically check whether the matrix is invertible because not always uh, matrices can be invertible. For example, if you remember, like if you're given like, so in terms of the, just the numbers, the scalars, if you're given a number t, it's inverse kind of is going to be one over two or two in the power of one. So that the multiplication is going to be equal to the one. But obviously not any scalar has an inverse, right? For example, zero doesn't have its inverse because one over zero doesn't make sense, right? So it doesn't make the multiplication of this to the zero to be equal to the one, basically. So uh, the same story is about the matrices. So not, not every matrix is invertible. And the matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is not zero. So we are basically are going to talk about the determinants so which is kind of a feature and the property of the matrix, which is going to help us to know whether the matrix is invertible or not, or to know other features about the matrices. Okay, we're going to talk about the determinants in more details, learn how to find the determinants in general for the n by n matrices. And here, one, one thing which I would like to note that here, uh, the, there is, it's, it's not just if its determinant is zero, right? Or is not zero. It's like it was a double F. What does it mean? It means that if and only if. So we're going to discuss basically about what does it mean? And you're going to discuss this in a course of linear algebra as well. But I, I just need to tell you that if and only if means that this proposition, this, pro, uh, this two statements work, work in both directions. What does it mean? It means that if the matrix invertible, then its determinant is not equal to zero. At the same time, if the determinant is not equal to the zero, then the matrix is not is invertible. So at the, at the first a glance, it might seem to you really obvious, but believe me that there is a difference. Okay, uh, we are going to discuss about this as well during this course.
Okay. So, well, basically, why we would need the inverse of the matrix. So, the finding the inverse like requires lots of efforts from us. So, we need to do a lot of operations in order to find the inverse of the matrix. And one of the advantages of knowing or finding the inverse would be to solve a system of linear equations. Or basically, we've learned about how we can store a system of linear equations in a matrix form, and it becomes to the system like AX is equal to the B, which, which seems like an equation, right? If you would look to this as just an equation, just a linear equation, and if I ask you, hey, can you solve me this equation? So the first thing which comes to your mind would be to just eliminate this A from here so that you are going to have just simply X on the left-hand side. And this is going to be equal to your solution, right? So this is basic idea of solving the matrix equations as well. So we can, we can use this idea, but in order to get rid of the A, I can't just like divide everything to the A, right? So I need to multiply the inverse of the A in order to get rid of this. So if I multiply the inverse from here, then this multiplication is going to be just the identity or simply one, right? And on the left-hand side, I'm, I'm, simply go, uh, I'm simply going to have just X. So since I multiplied A inverse to the left-hand side, I have to do the same with the right-hand side part. I'm going to multiply this to here. So then I'm going to have X is equal to the A inverse times B. So this is how we can find the solutions for the system of equations. But, but everything is not so easy. So the problem is like uh, solving one system of linear equations requires actually less time than finding, finding the inverse of the matrix. Okay, so if the matrix is huge, then finding the inverse of the matrix might require to solve many systems of linear equations. Or like it's, it's going to be a really complicated algorithm to find the inverse. And it doesn't really make sense for us to find the inverse to just solve one system of linear equations. But what if you are going to have many system of linear equations, basically 100 system of linear equations, where this part, this coefficient matrix, for all of these equations are going to be the same. So you can understand the system, like let's say one solution of the system is going to tell you the weather forecast for one hour, okay? So here on a B side, you are going to make the measurements of something like some physical, uh, properties of the atmosphere, for example, every hour. Like this is going to be the first hour, zero hour, first hour, second hour, and so on, hundreds hour. And, and always you're going to need to solve one system of linear equations with the same coefficient matrix in order to find the, uh, the weather, for example. Then in this case, it would be much more easier for us to find the inverse of the matrix once then use this inverse to solve all of this like hundred systems or thousand systems or million systems. Then in this case, we would uh, like, uh, we would save a lot of computational time. So basically we need to spend one time, a lot of efforts to find the inverse, but later on just finding the solution is going to be just like it, in terms of the complexity of the matrix multiplication, which is a way less than in Q. Okay, so one of the applications of the inverse of the matrices is to solve the system of linear equations when we need to do solve a lot of system of linear equations, not just one. And, and, and like, so we are going to talk about the matrices a little bit more deeper. We're going to do learn about lots of different uh, ways of factorization of the matrices. So working, off, working with the matrices is like fascinating and really interesting topic. So it's like, I, I, I hope that you, 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 will, you will really love the, the working with the matrices and the algorithms about the matrices. So uh, the, another special type of the matrices which we're going to talk is, is the orthogonal matrix. So this is really special matrix because if you remember, we say that, hey, the inverse of the matrix is a matrix when you're going to multiply A to its, uh, its inverse is going to equal to the identity. So the orthogonal matrices are really special because the, the inverse of the matrix is simply transpose of the matrix. And the transpose of the matrix is, is found really easily. So we, uh, we need to define first of all, what is the transpose of the matrix? So the transpose of the matrix is when you are going to just copy the rows of the matrix as the columns and the columns of the matrix as the rows. So which is really simple operations. So again, 
uh, the complexity of defining the inverse is might be like n cube and finding the transposes is probably linear when you're going to just copy the columns as the rows and the rows as the columns, right? So for the orthogonal matrices, we have this equation. So you just need to multiply A to its transpose in order to get the identity, not to the inverse, right? So let me explain you in a small example, what does it mean the uh, transpose of the matrix? If you are given this kind of matrix, then the transpose of this one is equal to this one, where we've just copied the first row as the first column, and the second row is just copied as the second column, okay? So this is the transpose. And you, you see that transpose is much more easier than finding the inverse. So the inverse is like a complicated process. Okay, so why we're talking about the orthogonal matrices. So do you remember that we could solve a system of linear equations, A x is equal to the B by just multiplying also the size to the inverse of the matrix, right? So we said, that, hey, so it's, it's, it, it is really difficult for us to find the inverse. At the same time, what if this matrix A would be orthogonal matrix? So let's define this as a Q, okay? Q x is equal to the B. So there is a special definition or notation of the orthogonal matrices. We are defining them, note, denoting them as a Q. So if, what if the Q is orthogonal? then solving the system becomes much more easier. So instead of finding the inverse of the Q, I'm just going to transpose this, which is like easy, right? So you just need to copy the row as a column, right? And Q transpose from here, and they are going to cancel each other, and I can solve the system um, easily. And the only problem is not every matrix is orthogonal, right? So if you are given a system of the equations and A is not orthogonal, we need to learn how to make it orthogonal. So one of the algorithms to make the matrices to be orthogonal. Um, so here is an explanation why the orthogonal matrices might be important. So instead of finding the inverse, we're going to just transpose the matrices in order to solve the matrix equations. So one of the ways to make the matrices to be orthogonal is so-called QR decomposition. So this is an algorithm which we're going to learn and probably we're going to implement this as well. So it is called the QR decomposition. So we are going to write down the A as a multiplication of one orthogonal matrix and one upper triangular matrix. So basically, if the matrix A is orthogonal, then everything is super nice because we can solve the system of linear equations by just transposing the matrix A. But if A is not orthogonal, then we can just multiply this or we can, we can just represent the A as a decomposition of the two matrices, like the orthogonal matrix and the upper trank matrix. So let's basically discuss how, how, how this could help us. So let's say we need to solve this kind of system of linear equations, like the matrix equation one more time. So in order to solve this, I'm going to just substitute the A with its QR decomposition. So I'm going to write it like a QRX times B. So now we know that we can get rid of this Q on the left-hand side, if I would just multiply, uh, to everything to the Q transpose, right? So from here and from here. So if I do this, then these two Qs are going to get rid of each other. So it's going to be just identity. And we're going to have this kind of system, Rx is equal to the Q transpose to the B. So in, in, here I mentioned that R is upper triangular matrix. So we didn't define what is the upper triangular matrix, but you should know that the upper triangular matrices are really special type of the matrices with lots of zeros inside the matrices. And if you are going to have this kind of system of linear equations with the upper triangular or lower triangular matrix times X, uh, so you can solve your system really easily just by just doing one time forward substitution or backward substitution. So if you go to our page with the complexity of the algorithms, you're going to find this D algorithms like a, a forward substitution and a backward substitution. So I'm going to explain to you what does it mean in the course as well. So if you're, you're so we're going to talk about the QR decomposition because uh, it's important for us again. So instead of finding the inverse sometimes, it is easier for us to solve a system of linear equations using the QR decomposition. And also we're going to talk about something which is called like least square solutions, least squares solutions. So it basically means to you that, hey, if your system of linear equations is not solvable, doesn't have any solution, then the least square solution would be the best approximate solution, okay? So if the system of linear equation doesn't have the solution, for example, because the A is not invertible, um, then
Okay, then, then, then we're going to find the, the best approximation. Okay, so in, in, in order to solve this kind of linear, so like the least squares, the QR, the composition of the matrix A is also important, is useful. So we are basically solving the least squares problem using the QR decomposition of the matrices. And one of the last decompositions we're going to discuss is called like a singular value decomposition. So basically writing down now the matrix, not just the multiplication of the two matrices, we're, we are going to write down, we're going to write down the matrices as a multiplication of the three matrices. So here A is going to be written as a multiplication of the A, which is an orthogonal matrix, uh, so U, sorry, which is an orthogonal matrix, times is a sigma, times is a V, which is also orthogonal matrix. So U and V are going to be two orthogonal matrices, and sigma is going to be a diagonal matrix. So diagonal matrix means like, so we are going to have non-zero elements only on the diagonal and everything is zero here, okay? So the, like, so the singular value decomposition algorithm has lots of applications in, in you know, real life. So one of like a two popular algorithms which we're going to discuss and implement is the face uh, recognition algorithm and also image compression algorithm. So you, we, if we watch the TV every day or we go through the stream of the Instagram or the Facebook every day and we see lots of, lots of photos, right? So usually all of these photos are compressed or being like being compressed somewhere and they are going to be sent to your computer, like not just like a full photo, but, by, by, but some, by, some, by some portions. So let's assume I've got just this photo with like with K is equal to the 300. K basically means the rank. So you, you rank of the matrix, which is a feature of the matrix again. So this matrix, can be just like, like th this image can be stored as the matrix where we are going to just grid this, for example, 300 by 300. And every grid is going to have here, so every grid here is going to have just the color code, for example, RGB code of this, uh, of this picture. So this is actually called a pixel, right? So what we're going to do is that we can compress this image. So instead of using all of the fields and store them and then transmit this, uh, transfer this to someone else, uh, we can just store less amount of the information. For example, I'm going to show you, uh, so another photo, which is going to be compressed now. So here, uh, the K is equal to the 100. K means some parameter of the single availability composition, okay? So it means that we're going to store just 100 numbers instead of 300, okay? And you can see here that the image quality is a little bit worse than the original one, but still it's, it's visible, right? So please note that the dimensions of the matrices are going to be the same. So this is like the first image here is 300 by 300. And the second image here is as well 300 by 300, but we are but we're using a less amount of the of the data to store. So if 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 I go even further, I can store this image with only k is equal to the 50. So basically, 50 values are going to be stored in order to store this image, and you can see the the difference, of course, between the first image and the second compressed image, right? But still the resolution of this image is going to be again 300 by 300. So if you're watching a, a TV, right? You're going to have like a big, uh, big, big picture, but it's going to be compressed, okay? So one of the applications of the SVD is the image compression. So actually it is used in, in nowadays as well. So in all of our social networks, if you have, uh, like ever noted that your pictures are stored like in it. So, so whenever you press the picture, so they're like a really, really smooth in the beginning, right? Like this, smooth, like this, then they become more resolved and resolved. And at the end, you're going to see a really good picture, right? So this is done so that the uh, pictures are going to be sent to you by the portions, by this kind of layers, okay? So we're going to discuss how to create this kind of layers using so-called SVD decomposition. And also another algorithm which we're going to learn and implement is, is called a face recognition. So if you're basically having the database with lots of faces, so if you're going to take a photo of someone, someone, how to find out this face from your database, 
Okay, so obviously comparing the two pictures by pixel by pixel is not a good solution since, uh, for example, if, if in the database I have a I have a photo with smiling and eyeglasses, for example, then if you take my photo when I'm not smiling and without eyeglasses, probably comparing the two photos pixel by pixel is not a good idea, right? So we're going to use the SVD decomposition also in order to find, um, to, in order to recognize the face. So this is basically the general concept of the course. So we are going to go a more, a more detailed and more deeper to everything which we have discussed in this in this lecture.